Uh, good afternoon, I'm Josh Green. Uh, today we're going to go over a topic called Analyzing FEMA's Community Lifeline Subcomponent Electronic Payment Processing to Determine the Effect on the Commercial Food Distribution Subcomponent During Stafford Act Disasters. So it's a big title, and there's a lot of moving parts in there, but um, it deals a lot with what I do for a living. So um, I work for FEMA Region 2 out of, uh, out of the Trade Center in uh, New York City, and I cover uh, New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And in that, my steady state job is on the REC. I'm the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinator, which is created after uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. And FEMA's really big failure on communications during that. Uh, they developed this position on one per region, so there's 10 of us throughout the nation. And we really work with commercial infrastructure, and communications infrastructure, and the state and local infrastructure in dealing with communications so that we're not strangers on a really bad day. We know who's already in, the, who are the players, and where we need to work on our interoperability. My disaster role is I run ESF2, which is Emergency Support Function 2, which is communications in the field. And that's basically gathering situational awareness, uh, uh, doing some analysis on it, and serving it to all the key players on a silver platter saying, here's what's broken. And then certain people have to take action on that uh, in the state government or state, state local government. And if they can't fix it or they're overwhelmed, that's where I step in as the federal government and I have the deepest pocketbooks and all the other federal staff to help, help me out. And we solve problems in major disasters. It's rarely used, but it's one of those things that we go through uh, through the staff would have to do. In doing this, uh, I ran across this issue with GIS, and we'll, we'll talk about the background. And this is how we got to this presentation where we're at today. All right, so the background, the background of the background. So all this started back in 2017 with uh, a really bad disaster season. Hurricane Harvey devastated Texas with record flooding. Uh, Hurricane Irma and Maria hit the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, absolutely wiping out infrastructure. Uh, we had a volcano in Hawaii eruption that, that took out a, a small community. And we had multiple fires on the west coast of uh, the United States, which typically FEMA doesn't really respond to uh, major fires. But due to the size, we had to empty out all of our deployable forces. There's about 2,200 FEMA employees about 1,700, or excuse me, 22,000 female employees, and about 17, 16,000 members were deployed at any given time, which was a record. Everyone that wasn't holding down a, a key position at headquarters was put to the field, and we, we put everybody out. It, we made a lot of mistakes with FEMA. Uh, so in 2019, we came out with the FEMA Stabilization Guide. And this guide is really about putting the right resource in the right place at the right time. And that built out this lifeline concept. And, and in this lifeline concept is the communications lifeline concept, which I run out in the field. We'll fast forward to 2022, Hurricane Fiona had made landfall in Puerto Rico as a category one storm. Uh, that's what that's gonna be our case study for today of how we're taking this old information that we learned on this disaster and turning it into a better product. Uh, and the stuff I've learned since 2002, through my training in the courses, through my, my on the job training and sort of built onto that. And then finally is ESF2 um, uh, communications. That's what I do for a living. And we've sort of discussed that. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit here uh, in a second. Okay, so the co lifeline uh, components. This is a big slide here. There's a couple slides like this. Just wanna show you where we're living at. This is, this is the world I live in during disasters. Today, we're gonna talk about food, hydration, shelter. That's, uh, and then we'll talk about the food component of that. Oh, I need to get my little cursor here. And then we'll talk about uh, communications. And finance actually falls under communications. The, they never really gave us a reason why they put finance with us, but it has to do with data. Finance can't happen unless data is available. And so that's what we, we uh, gather situational awareness on and do uh, actions with. Here's a little bit more in-depth view. This is my bread and butter, what I do for a living. My cell phone is full of every CEO, operating manager, emergency manager for AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, uh, cable landing stations, uh, Starlink, any commercial vendor that has communications, I have their, their, their secret number to call them and say, what are you doing about this situation? Along with that, I work with alerts, warnings, and messaging. Uh, we work with 911 and dispatch, responder communications, and then finance. And then today, we're going to use electronic payment processing uh, as our subject to talk about. Same idea food, hydration, shelter, it's typically held by a different division doing a different job, but we have interdependencies. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how those interdependencies work with each other. 
Our study area is Puerto Rico. Uh, here in the left uh, inset, you can see the path that Hurricane Maria took, uh, absolutely devastating Puerto Rico. It's a $40 billion recovery disaster. Um, they've only done about $9 billion worth of recovering, and we've allocated, meaning the, the money's there waiting for them, about $33 billion so far. Uh, so there's, there, there's still so much to be done in Puerto Rico. And the orange track, you can see Hurricane Fiona's uh, landfall track. Uh, Hurricane Fiona is uh, what we call a rapid intensifying storm. We thought it was going to be a, a tropical wave or tropical storm when it came by. The last minute, it picked up steam uh, as it entered the warm uh, waters of the uh, Caribbean Sea and rapidly intensified in the last 12 hours, came across as a Category 1. And uh, really, the, the storm itself wasn't devastating, but the winds took down the power infrastructure for Puerto Rico, leading to a, an island-wide power outage, uh, which has 3 million people on the island, not including uh, uh, tourists, and really brought the island to a standstill and disabled the island. All right, so now let's talk about our need and our goal. In reality, I need a faster way to analyze the data to get timely information about the disruptions to the lifelines. That's that's the whole goal here. And then I need a method to measure the disruption. Uh, we'll talk a lot of the conclusions about uh, hunches and like old old man uh, knowledge and, and gut feelings and everything. We're trying to eliminate that in FEMA. We're trying to go to fact-based decision-making, and we want to get towards that through these two goals. Okay, so let's get into the methods. So first we'll talk about our raw data. Census block, uh, the census block borders and the data was part of one of our stepping stones here. And this visa open store, open store data. So let's talk about this for a second. So we negotiated with, that, with visa that they will send us a report every morning at 10 o'clock in the morning of which stores were open, quotation mark, or closed. And if it was open, it means it had some type of some type of power source, whether it's uh, commercial power, solar generator, uh, uh, wind power, some some sort of power, and they had some sort of backhaul data backhaul to get an internet signal to transmit the visa data back and forth, and someone swiped a card in that twenty four hour period. So if it had a, if it had a yes in the box for that day, it meant it had those three criteria, and if it had a blank, it just didn't have one of those three and no one swiped a card that day. And they send that to us in a big Excel file and it's about 18,000 um, businesses in Puerto Rico use that service, uh, visa service. So each day we can see which ones are open and which ones were closed. And it's really just a spreadsheet. It's great information. I got this in the middle of Fiona. We've been talking about it before Fiona hit, but I got it every single day. And I built some rudimentary charts and some rudimentary I mean, I'm a little embarrassed. I didn't put it in the presentation because I'm a little embarrassed because of how amateur it was. Uh, but I couldn't get any GIS support because they were being pulled in other directions. Um, so these are our two uh, data sets that we used. Then we used the clipping tool. Uh, the operations section chief is in charge of operations. My boss gave me his area of concern, which is five municipalities in the southwest area, uh, southwest coast of Puerto Rico. And we clipped everything so that we were just dealing with that. Then we use a service area tool to take those uh, locations that were open and we did a 15 minute roll drive to the grocery store to see our service area to that grocery store. Um, so we could build a polygon of like who's actually close enough to the grocery stores to use them. We use the 15 minutes and roll because the USDA says the average drive time to a grocery store is 15 minutes. People won't drive more than that. They'll just like figure out other solutions and there's a whole backstory and lots and lots of uh, uh detailed analysis about how far people will drive to grocery stores more than i realized so we use 15 minutes for this because it's a good starting point and as we learn more i'll probably have to change that but that's our starting point so that gives us a polygon um so that we can see who's within 15 minutes then we use our tabular intersection tool and our census data to overlay the two and figure out what is the estimated population per polygon of, of what's happening in that region and in that area of concern. And the results bring us that estimated population within 15 minutes. They look like this. I can get it worked, okay. So we're, these are real quick maps that are drawn up so that I can give this to, to leadership and help them understand what's happening. 
in FEMA's real world in external affairs, they would never release a map that looks like this um, because there's so much to it they would want to change. But this is like what we do. I have I have three hours to get my report ready from 10 o'clock to one o'clock when it's due. So we don't really care about the, the true details. I just need data to, to show the bosses. So this is on the 12th of September. This is a, uh, a, a steady state day before the storm. And you can see that there are Oh, I got it backwards. I found a typo. There's uh, 34 stores supporting this population. And then we see over here on the 18th, this is the day after the storm or the day of the storm hitting. There was only five grocery stores supporting a population of 29,000. I'll have to look in the notes here to make sure I correct these typos. But you can see this, the, the study area here, and you can see the polygons that we use. And then after we layer, layer the census data, we can understand who's in that area and what's being affected. And basically, this data right here builds us a handy chart. So when we run the, the code that we built for this, um, it's 165 lines of code in Python. Um, and it spits out this data for us, spits out the number. I should probably use better terms here. Uh, it shows us the number of stores open and the population served within 15 minutes. And then using Excel and some math formulas, we can figure out how many people are served per store on average, and then the population not within that 15 minute uh, drive. Um, you can see here, pre and this yep, this orange line denotes the uh, hurricane landfall. So you can see pre-storm, we're hovering in the 40s. Post-storm, we crash down to five, eight, and 25. And then we sort of, the way that we analysis in this is talking with some uh, coworkers, pretty much the, store, the stores that are left are the ones that didn't have damage and were running on uh, generator power or some type of other power source. And then you can see the averages here for how many people are served per store on average if you were to average all out. And this is what we're looking for is like stress to the store. Does the store really have enough food to uh, to service 25,000 people? Probably not. 21,000, probably not. You can see pre-storm, it was in the uh, below 5,000 and post-storm were above 5,000. And this means that they, the stores are being stressed. Uh, and then, we, of course, we have this population not within the 15-minute uh, drive time that we understand that populations aren't uh, do not have grocery stores available to them in order to uh, to receive groceries. To me, this makes a lot of sense because I live in this data. It's, it's a great tool. From this data, we break, break out these charts. These charts are mainly used to educate leadership on what's happening. Um, when I get a chance to talk to the operations section chief or the federal coordinating officer, it's usually two or three minutes in a hallway be between meetings um, because communications doesn't always get the, the uh, not prestige, the attention it needs until it's gone. Um, so, so I have to fight for, and advocate for, for ESF2. So here's our chart that shows the number of stores open. You can see how pre-storm, and then as soon as the storm was approaching, as soon as it hit, uh, had that large decline, and it never really recovers even after 10 days later. Here's our grocery stores open with the population served within 15 minutes. We want this number to be higher. Higher is better. And you can see the dip for the storm. And this comes up pretty back up pretty fast um, because we had the, at least five stores open. Here's our population not within uh, 15 minutes of an open grocery store. And then finally, our population served per grocery store if you were to average it out. And you can see beforehand is about 5,000 people per day. And then post-storm, we're in that 7,000 to 10,000 range, meaning that if we were to average it all out, the population has fewer stores to choose from, and the stores are probably being stressed out and supply chain management issues might be happening. So what does this mean? Uh, first and foremost, it means I have a process, I have a code, I have a working, repeatable, accurate process to analyze this data. Uh, before, well, actually, when I was doing it uh, for the project, it took me about 20 minutes to do it. And that's with all of my schooling that I've had since 2022. When we did it in the middle of the storm and I was doing my rudimentary uh, products, it was much longer. So breaking this information down is so much faster now. Um, very happy with the product. It's it's a uh, reusable, repeatable, and accurate. Very happy with it. And then once we have this, I can edit it to measure other lifelines. Now that I have the process, 
There's several other lifelines and subcomponents that I can use this for. Maybe not the same exact idea, but very similar ideas. Um, we move into fact-based decision-making. This is my favorite, or second favorite part. It's measurable disruption to the lifeline. I, as Josh Green, I am sick of old man knowledge and I have a hunch and I did it back this way in 1970. FEMA as a whole is we're trying to move away from that. We're moving to fact-based knowledge. We'll never get away from like having to use your hunch or your gut feeling, but we want to use facts to make decisions. It's getting people hurt by not doing it. And I'm the only one doing it in the ESF2 world. Uh, and I've got a lot of people backing me up and we're going to make this a, a better idea. And then finally, we need some uh, need some ground verification. Although we have this data, is there really food on the shelves? They may be swiping this card and they're just selling candy bars because that's all they have left. So we need someone to validate some of this information on the ground and working with my bosses and what we've already talked about before. I think we're going to have a method to this um, in the next big disaster in region two. We might have a, a method to get out there and check this ground verification. Uh, when we talk about trash, uh, excuse me, cash transactions, there's no way for me to track them. Um, there might be stores that have power and refrigeration and supply chain management is good and they're making cash transactions, but currently there's no way for me to measure that in real time for a response. Might be able to do that post, post disaster to more of a recovery after action report, but right now there's no way for me to, to track cash. And we're definitely gonna use social media in the future. Um, FEMA Region 2 has paid for some very expensive software that uh, crawls social media based off keywords, and they can uh, output reports based on what you want. They're, de they're setting one up for me for communications so that I can see where people are having issues communicating, uh, or maybe uh, this data idea here that we're talking about. We're trying to explore that more, uh, and everyone's on board. And then we have some follow-on work. Um, I need to make this a real-life application. Um, everything I've done so far has been on my school computer because uh, FEMA stuff is pretty locked down um, due to DHS policies and such. And I have to have, there's workarounds in order to use Python. Uh, when I told my coworkers that's what I wanted to use was Python, there's one guy that knows the, the workarounds and he's going to work with me next week to bring this full circle. Um, I need to work in region two. Although I made it for the Southwest uh, portion of Puerto Rico, I have to make a, I'm going to go ahead and do all my pre-data as soon as possible so that anywhere in my region, I can tweak my code, uh, add or delete uh, counties or what, however I need to, and have it ready for the next disaster. So there's some follow-up work there. Um, my coworkers, I have five staff. I have uh, myself and I have four other telecom specialists that, are, that work for me. Um, we have a motto, like no one is the linchpin that holds this group together and they all have to be able to do everyone's jobs. So they're gonna get a crash course in GIS with some help of other coworkers. So once this is set up, they can form the the, the base processes. Uh, Cause there's a joke is like, what if Josh Green falls down and breaks his leg? Um, how are you gonna do the job? So, that, so we're working on uh, ensuring everyone knows how to do the uh, basic processes. And we have, unfortunately, if you've seen one FEMA region, you've only seen one FEMA region. Uh, we're pretty uh, different based on culture, uh, leadership priorities, funding. So each region, uh, each of the 10 FEMA regions are a little different, but we're going to share every best practice that we have here in region two with the other regions to help them out. And finally, we're going to visualize ESF2. Like you saw on the slide before, ESF2 and the communications lifeline covers a variety of things from AM, FM radio stations to uh, peace apps and 911 centers. Uh, we're going to visualize all of that using the stuff I learned from this project and this in the school itself. Um, really excited to work on that and using those products and what we visualize, we're going to show how the inter interdependencies are with other lifelines. Here we've talked about the food, water, hydration, uh, interdependency with data. There's many, many other versions of that. And there's one thing for us to all talk about it in the room. It's another thing for us to visualize it and measure it with fact based decision making. I can't stress it enough. So we're kind of excited about this and uh, I'm kind of excited about this and um, we're working in the right direction. And pending any questions, that is my presentation.